If you're bringing any of your rebellion into your new life, you haven't let go of your old life. You say, but I had a good reason. No, you had a reason. No, but it was a good reason. At the time, you thought it was a good reason. But lay down everything and let Christ tell you how to be. And it's in the Word. When he said, listen to this, you've got to understand something about these works God's talking about. They were prepared before the foundations of the earth, before he even created man. And the Bible calls them good works. Do you know what a good work is? It's a work that's successful and is completed. Think about that. It's a successful work and it's completed. And he said, I've preordained you to walk in them. And I thought, well, that's great. But you know what that, work, that word walk means? It's, it's peripateo. Peripateo. And it means this, to tread all around and walk as proof of your ability to overcome. So that means when God created you for a good work, he already put in you everything you need to walk broadly and overcome. So quit letting God tell you to do something and going, oh, I can't do that. Shut up. Slap yourself. Get in the mirror and say, I don't know who you are, but knock it off. You're more than a conqueror. But you're never going to be all those things that the Word of Faith people have been teaching us, that the books that Dad put out about in Him, in Him, in Him, who you are. Who you, you'll never be that as long as you're trying to make you. Let Him make you. He's already made you. Let it come out. I'm a single man. I have needs. I love Jesus, but God created me with needs, and he knows I need. If you need so badly, become a baker. (laughs) Women, well, I have my pride. Yeah, ain't that the truth? And look where it got Lucifer. Be the real you. You were created to walk around as an overcomer. You were created to have great destiny. You were created to to walk by and so that other people look at how you're completing this work God intended and gave you the ability to complete. And other people would look and say, my God. How is that possible? Another opportunity for sharing the gospel of Christ. I, I, want, I want to read. Who here has an amplified Bible on them? I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 2.10, Wes. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Where's your mic? Put it on your mic. Um, listen to this verse. Listen to this verse in the the Amplified. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Do you want a long life? Then be the real you, because as long as you're trying to make yourself, you will not have long life, or you will not have a successful and joyful long life. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, and this is from the same translation, but uh, I, it, each of us is created, as, uh, we're created to be yourself. You've got to understand, we were all created to be different from one another, not, not to be a carbon copy of somebody we find is different. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. In his grace, listen to this, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Did you ever ever notice that when Paul wrote about the gift, he said, covet the best gifts, 
not covet the gifts somebody else has because you want them? He, say, he said, I would prefer that you prophesy. Simple gift of prophecy. But he said gifts, plural. You say, well, that's right. I want the best gifts. Yes, but not the ones you think are the best. The ones that he knows are the best for you to complete the good works he's called you to tread about in victory in. God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if you're coveting the wrong gifts, you'll never do anything successfully well more than occasionally. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, then speak out with as much faith as God has given you. I, I, it, it, used to, it, it would drive me crazy when, when I hear, somebody's got a word here. Who's got the word? And I'd look. Everybody would be like. Or, or, or they'd have their Bible. Oh, yeah. Or they'd do this. They can't make eye contact with a pastor. And then finally, I'd say, come on. I had one, young la- one lady uh, in our church. I could always tell when the Spirit of God was on her. She turned red like Carmen's jacket. Red as a beat. She just said, she, she, and red, 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 red. And I'd, every time the Spirit of God was on her for that. I said, you know you've got the word. Come up. I wouldn't even look at her. She'd get up and come up. She knew who I was talking to. And she had a word. She had a word. That was wrong. That was wrong. Now, I have people who think they've got a word anytime we say, oh, somebody's got a word. And I see no anointing on them at that place. I see none. It's a clear sunny day at the beach, not even a cloud in the sky. That's what I see all around them. No glory cloud, no anointing, just, I got a word. I would, nothing I appreciate more is if I've got my people up here and I turn to somebody and, I, and sometimes, and they'll tell you, sometimes I say, do you have a word? And I appreciate it when they'll go, no. Then there are others who I don't ask sometimes because they'll go, yes, I don't want it. I don't want it. Why? Because you just kind of made it up. But you don't think you made it up. You, you, if I can get the warm tinglys, that means I got the word. Maybe if I flex all my muscles at the same time, it'll feel like the anointing. <laughs> Bible says if service, ooh, can you imagine if being yourself, God created you to be a servant? You know, people say amen out loud, though. Inside, they say, don't you dare. (laughs) I don't want to be a servant. I have things to do. I have a house to clean. I have to bake cookies for my kids. Uh, I really don't want to be bothered. I really don't want to be bothered. We're going to have a group Saturday, and everybody's going to come. Well, that's cool. I can show up, say hi, walk around, pick up a couple of things and leave and nobody will notice. Exactly. I are such a servant. That's not, a, a, you know what a servant does on a daily basis? Who can tell me? Serve. They serve. They don't even realize they're serving. They're being themselves. When you run into people who just, they can't help themselves. They are overcome with trying to help people. You know, anything I can do for you today? Oh, I, you know, I, 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 I just, I did this. Uh, um, my, wife, my wife made a whole batch of cookies, and I just thought, man, there's some guys here in the office that would love these. Or, man, I know 
you like, you like baseball. And one of the, one of the guys uh, at, at, uh, you know, where, where, I, where I bowl had tickets that he got to this game and he can't go and ask me if I wanted them or if I knew anybody could use them and you're the first person I thought of. Maybe they wanted to go, but they'd rather give. Oh, I'd love to help you, Pastor, but I got a pickup game. Who knows what a pickup game is? Devin, what's a pickup game? Right, usually spur of the moment. Okay. I'd love to help you, Pastor, but I'm committed to a pickup game. How do you get committed to a pickup game? It's a spur of the moment thing. What do you have, a schedule? Next Thursday, we're going to have a pickup game. Next Thursday, we are going to automatically decide, ah, let's have a game. But we wanted to tell you now so that you'll know to be surprised. Servant. What is a servant? A servant is not a slob. A servant is not a lay down. A servant is not a walk over. A servant is a priest and king unto God. If you're called to teach, teach, the, teach heartily. One, but, but one translation says this. But if you're going to teach, teach the truth or shut up. Not your interpretation of the truth. We we'll say, well, pastor, well, how do I know what the truth is then? Because there are so many of these wonderful teachers who are teaching me that this means this and that means that. Prove it with scripture that says it succinctly, precisely, and doesn't leave any openings for another translation. Would anybody here have a hard time finding a scripture in the New Testament that specifically tells a person not to commit fornication or adultery. Do you, how many here could, 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 find, could easily find that scripture? Nobody? I'm gonna have to have, we're going to have to have a holiness meeting. How many of you could find a verse in the New Testament that says don't commit fornication, don't commit adultery? Okay. So if somebody comes up and says it's okay to sleep around, you can go back to I have needs. Take a cold shower, and, and, and then and then take your take your take your flesh to the Bible and find out that those kind of needs are satisfied only in marriage. So quit hitting on people. Quit acting holy on Sunday and carnal on Tuesday. Quit flirting. Quit flirting. How many know people flirt? A lot of people flirt. Some people flirt in order to get somebody else in trouble. Some people flirt because they don't have enough brains to get a cup for water without a hole in the bottom. Some people flirt because they don't know what else to do and they have needs. Whatever reason, it's no different than somebody who has to say nice things about people that are their enemies and pray for them. Be like Christ. Be like Christ. Be like Christ. Would, it, would you have a hard time teaching the truth that says, Treat your enemies well. Can anybody here find a scripture that tells you to treat your enemies well? Or those that despitefully use you? Easy, right? So if somebody comes up and they give you a teaching, and they say, well, this means this. And they'll give you a lot of scriptures, but they kind of, sort of, might, maybe elude to that but they could also allude to something else. Is that a confirming scripture? No. It's got to say it. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. No one can come to me but, by the, but unless the Father draws him. Anyone who tries to get into the, into the sheepfold by climbing over and not going through the gate, which is me, 
won't get into heaven. So it's pretty standard. There are plenty of scriptures that directly tell you you don't go to heaven without Jesus. So if you're going to teach, teach truth or don't teach. I've got quite a few more, but I'm not going to do that to you. We've got enough time that's gone by. We'll pick it up when I come back. But what I want you to start thinking about while, until, until we, we, we have another message together is start thinking about how much of you being you isn't really you. Start thinking about how much of your character is really reflecting Christ as much of the day as, it poss- as you possibly can. I don't expect anybody to exactly, perfectly act like Jesus all the time. We're all learning. We're all on a different learning curve. Mm-hmm. And, and, and even if you're a mature believer, let's face it, in some areas, even the mature believers are immature. We all have areas to grow. If we tried to carry, start off, okay, I'm going to make, start at the bottom, I'm going to do the whole load, and we're all, they're all going to improve at the same time. And you live your whole life crushed under the beginning load because there's more than you can deal with. You pick the one the Lord says, okay, let's work on this rough edge. Or let's work on this dull, let's work on this dull edge or this overly sharp edge. You do that. And then you, you go. So ask the Lord. Say, God, where am I not being the me you created? And then ask him, and, and, and just take the first thing he tells you. Don't get out a notepad. I know some of you. Some of you come back with a 17-page list and 14 reasons on each number on that list of what you have to do to do it. And in 14 years, you will still have the list and won't have accomplished one. So the first thing that he tells you is the most important thing he wants you to work on. And remember, when you start and ask him, don't put on the radio. Don't have your tablet open. Don't start humming your favorite tune just in case it's the thing you don't want him to tell you. Because I would never do that. I just heard that technique from somebody else. Haven't we all, huh? Haven't we all? Sometimes, you know, one of the things he may tell you is, I would love to, but you don't really want to be the yourself I made. You want to be the one you decided to be. And now you've got to sit down and just get honest with Jesus and say, wow, God, I'm not that committed to you, am I? I love you just as long as you don't step in my soup. Be willing to get your feet wet, y'all. Hopefully it's broth and not noodles. (laughs) That's tough. hate getting noodles out of my shoe. Let's stand. Father, we just come before you right now in Jesus' name. I just ask that as this message is starting to settle into the minds and hearts of all of us, myself included, we begin to get serious about becoming that ourself that you actually created and and predestined before the face of the earth for us to have things to walk in. Honest, Lord, I don't want to know how many things I've already missed by trying to create myself. But just speak to me and show me where you want me to start. What what I need to get more in line with who you really are and who you really made me. And then I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to help me walk through it and give me the wisdom and the understanding and the courage to become the real me. I ask that in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen.